from the American Experience Storybook. Susan B. Anthony, 1820-1906 Here in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence is the assertion of the natural right of all to the ballot. For how can the consent of the governed be given if the right to vote be denied? From Is It a Crime for a Citizen of the United States to Vote? Speech, 1873. Susan B. Anthony was born to fight for what she believed was right. Her Quaker family modeled for her what it looked like to take a stand and influence the world by hosting abolitionist meetings, sometimes attended by Frederick Douglass, and advocating for limitations on alcohol sales. When Susan grew up and began supporting these causes on her own, she discovered another injustice which she could not let stand. Women had woefully unequal rights. At a temperance convention, Susan tried to give a speech but was denied because she was a woman. She realized that until women could own property and vote, politicians had no reason to take them seriously, and women should be taken seriously. Being marginalized for femininity made Susan even more sensitive to people marginalized because of their race. In an anti-slavery march, Susan met fellow women's rights activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and they began campaigning together. They formed a Women's National Loyal League to petition against slavery, published a women's rights-focused newspaper called The Revolution, and founded the American Equal Rights Association and the National Woman's Suffrage Association. Susan passed away before the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote, but not before she voted herself. In 1872, Susan demanded to be registered and voted illegally. She was later fined $100, but never paid the fine. The following excerpts are from The Life and Work of Susan B. Anthony, Volume 1 of 2, by Ida Husted Harper. Chapter 2. Girlhood and School Life In the spring of 1832, a brick kiln was burned in preparation for the new house. Mrs. Anthony boarded 10 or 12 brickmakers and some of the factory hands with no help but that of her daughters, Gilma, Susan, and Hannah age 14, 12, and 10. When the new baby came, these three little girls did all the work, cooking the food and carrying it four or five steps up from the kitchen to the mother's room to let her see if it were nicely prepared and if the dinner pails for the men were properly packed. Soon after this, Mr. Anthony remarked that one of the spoolers was ill and there was no one to do her work. Susan and Hannah had spent many hours watching the factory girls and at once raised a clamor to take the place of the sick spooler. The mother objected, but the father, who always encouraged his children in their independent ideas, interceded, and finally they were allowed to draw straws and decide who should go, the winner to divide her wages with the loser. The lot fell to Susan, who worked faithfully every day for two weeks and received a full wage, three dollars. Hannah, with her dollar fifty, bought a green bean bag, then considered the crowning glory of a girl's wardrobe. Susan purchased half a dozen pale blue coffee cups and saucers, which she had heard her mother wish for, and presented them to her with a happy heart. The next summer, the house was built, the finest in that part of the country, a two and a half story brick with fifteen rooms and all the conveniences then known. Quakers never celebrate Christmas, but the Anthonys, having lived now for seven years in a Presbyterian neighborhood, decided to give the children a Christmas party in the new home. The walls had a beautiful hard finish, the woodwork was tinted light green, and the new flag-bottom chairs were painted black. Between the rough boots of the country youths and the chairs pushed or tipped against the wall, both woodwork and plastering were almost ruined and the new house carried a lasting reminder of the festivities. About this time, Daniel Anthony was again brought under Quaker criticism. On one of his journeys to New York, he had bought a camlet coat with a big cape as affording the best protection for long, cold rides he had to take. 
The friends declared this to be out of plainness and insisted he leave off the cape and cease wearing a brightly colored handkerchief about his neck and ears. Daniel, who was beginning to be rather restive under these restraints, refused to comply. But as he was a valuable member, it was finally decided here also to condone his offense. Through all those years, Lucy Anthony went to the Quaker meeting with her husband. After public services were over, however, the shutters pulled up between the men's and the women's side of the house for business meeting. She was rigidly barred out. She would take her children and walk about in the graveyard outside while she waited for Daniel. But as the graves were all in a row without even a headstone to distinguish them, this was not a very interesting pastime. And the wait was long and tedious. When the little girls went with the father, they also were shut out of the executive session where such monumentous questions were discussed as, are friends careful to keep themselves and their children from attending places of diversion? Are friends careful to refrain from tail-bearing and detraction? Are friends careful to send their children to school and all children in their employ? One cold day, the mother being detained at home, 10-year-old Susan received permission to go with her father. When the business meeting began, she curled up quietly in a corner by the stove, thinking to escape detection, but was spied out by one of the elders, a woman with green spectacles, who tiptoed down from the high seat and said, Is thee a member? No, but my father is, replied Susan. That will not do. He will have to go out. My mother told me to stay in. Thy mother doesn't manage things here. But my father told me to stay in. Neither thy father nor thy mother can say what thee shall do here. Thee will have to go out. And taking the child by the arm, she led her into the cold vestibule. After remaining there until almost frozen, Susan decided to go to the nearest neighbors. When she opened the gate, a big dog sprung fiercely upon her. Her screams brought out the family, and she was taken into the house where it was found the only injury was a large piece bitten out of the new scotch plaid coat, which she had gone to meeting on purpose to exhibit. The affair created a considerable excitement. Mr. and Mrs. Anthony were very indignant, and it ended in the father's making a request that his children be made members of the society, which was done. Daniel Anthony was by nature a broad, progressive man, and his family were not brought up according to the strictest and narrowest requirements of Quaker doctrine. While his wife, remembering the liberal teachings of her universalist father and her own girlish love of youthful pastimes, went still further in making life pleasant for the children. Through her influence, the daughters secured many a pretty article of wearing apparel, and when there was a party whose hours were later than the father approved, the mother managed to have them spend the night with girls in the neighborhood. When the family first moved to Battenville, the children went to a little old-fashioned district school taught by a man in winter and a woman in summer. None of the men could teach Susan Long Division or understand why a girl should insist upon learning it. One of the women maintained discipline by means of her corset board used as a fair rule. As soon as Mr. Anthony finished the brick store, he set apart one room upstairs for a private school, employed the best teachers he had, and admitted only such children as he wished to associate with his own. When the new house was built, a large room was devoted to school purposes. This was the first in that neighborhood to have a separate seat for each pupil. And although only a stool without a back, it was a vast improvement on the long bench running around the wall, the same height for big and little. The girls were taught so as carefully as reading and spelling, and Susan was noted for her skill with the needle. A sampler is still in existence, which she made at the age of 11, a fine specimen of needlework with the family record surrounded by a wreath of strawberries, all carefully wrought in care rules. There's also a bed quilt, the pieces sewed together with fine over and over stitches, and there are ruffles hemmed with stitches so tiny they scarcely can be distinguished. Each teacher was a cousin. Nancy Howe, who was followed by another cousin, Sarah Anthony, a graduate of Rensselaer Quaker Boarding School. 
Among the teachers was Mary Perkins, just graduated from Miss Grant's seminary at Ipswich, Massachusetts, and a pupil of Mary Lyon, a founder of Mount Holyoke. She was their first fashionably educated teacher and taught them to recite poems in concert, introduced school books with pictures, little black illustrations of old dog tray, Mary and her lamb, etc., and gave them their first idea of calisthenics. She loved music and wished to attend the village singing school. Lucy Anthony sympathized with this desire and interceded for her, but Daniel decided it would be setting a bad example to the children and they would be wanting to sing. Into this commodious home, Lucy Anthony brought her aged father and mother and carefully tended them till the death of both within the same year, aged 84. In May 1834 came the first great sorrow, the death of little Eliza, aged two years, and mother was heartbroken. Her life was centered in her children, and she could not be reconciled to giving up even one. After her own death, nearly 50 years later, in her box of most sacredly guarded keepsakes, was found a little faded pink dress of the dear child's, which many times had been moistened with the mother's tears. The children continued to attend this private school, and as Gilma and Susan reached the age of 15, each in turn was installed as teacher in summer, when there were only young pupils. The factory now was at the height of prosperity. There was only one larger in all the part of the country, and Daniel Anthony was looked upon as a wealthy man. He was much criticized for allowing his daughters to teach, as in those days no woman worked for wages except for pressing necessity. But he was far enough in advance of his time to believe that every girl should be trained to self-support. In 1837, writing to Gilma at the boarding school, he urged her to accept the offer of the principal to remain through the winter as an assistant. I am fully of the belief that shouldst thou never teach school a single day afterward, thou wouldst ever feel to justify thy course. Thou wouldst seem to me to be laying the foundation for thy far greater usefulness. Thy remaining through the winter must, however, be left solely to thyself, as it would be of little avail for thee to stay and not be contented. Thy home, Gilma, is just the same as when thou left it, and shouldst thou decide to spend the winter months away, we will try to keep it the same until thy return in the spring. Let me, though, if thou canst be content to remain only a few months longer from thy mother's kitchen. In the winter of 1837, at the age of 17, Susan taught in the family of Doris and Holda Delvridge at Easton, a few miles from Battenville, for a dollar a week and board. The next summer, she taught a district school at the neighboring village of Reed's Corners for a dollar fifty a week and boarded round, and proud was she to earn what was then considered excellent wages for a woman. In the fall, she joined Gilma at boarding school. The little circular yellow with age, reads, Deborah Molson, having obtained an agreeable location in the pleasant village of Hamilton, in the vicinity of Philadelphia, intends, with the assistance of competent teachers, to open immediately a seminary for females. Terms, $125 per annum for boarding and tuition. The inculcation of the principles of humility, morality, and a love of virtue will receive particular attention. This was Susan's first long absence from home, and her letters and journals give a good idea of the thoughts and feelings of a girl at boarding school in those days. She developed then the letter-writing habit, which has clung to her through life. The letters of that time were laborious affairs, often consuming days in writing, commencing even to children, respected daughter or son, and rarely exceeding one or two pages. They were written with quill pen on foolscap paper and almost wholly devoted to the weather and sickness in the family. The amount of the latter would be appalling to modern households. The women's letters were written in infinitesimal characters, it being considered unladylike to write a large hand. The Anthonys were exceptional letter writers. It cost 18 cents to send a letter, but Daniel Anthony was postmaster at Battenville, and his family had free use of the mails. 
If he had had postage to pay on all the homesick Susan epistles, it would have cost him a good round sum. The rules of the school required these to be written on the slate, submitted to the teacher, then carefully copied by the pupil, so it is not unusual to find that a letter was five or six days in preparation. For the same reason, it is impossible to tell how much sincerity there is in the frequent references to the dear teacher and the most excellent school. But the stilted style of Susan's letters is most amusing. A few extracts will illustrate. And we'll get on with those extracts in the next video. In the meantime, I think we'll pause here and continue with Susan B. Anthony next time. Thanks so much for listening. Please click like and subscribe. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.